Bye. Uh, good morning, everybody in the U.S., and good evening to those of you who are watching from India. I'm Sudhanand Dhume of the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm really looking forward to hosting a Google Hangout today with three of the most knowledgeable people on the Indian economy and Indian politics. Uh, with exit polls showing that the BJP's Narendra Modi is overwhelmingly likely to be India's next prime minister, we'd like to take this a little forward and talk about Modi's prospects as an economic reformer. So we're going to kick this off with the, the discussion is titled, Can Narendra Modi be India's Margaret Thatcher? And joining me are Vivek Dehejia of Carlton University, Mihir Sharma of Business Standard in New Delhi, and James Crabtree, who's a Financial Times correspondent in Mumbai. So why don't I start with Vivek? Vivek, why don't you take a stab at the big question? Is it fair to call Narendra Modi India's a prospective Thatcher for India, or is it somewhat ludicrous? Well, I think it's a little overblown uh, for a couple of reasons. But let me just say this, Adanand, that that you know, at at a at one level, sort of at at a uh, at, at the, the it, it, it's a very fetching comparison because if you look at the biographies, if not what policies we expect they might pursue, uh, there is something interesting about someone who is an outsider uh, coming, uh, sort of storming the the bastion, as it, as it were, of his own of his or her own party, uh, and now uh, the nation. Uh, someone who was seen even a few years ago as sort of a fringe figure, a divisive figure, and of course he's often seen that way still. Uh, so, in terms of biographies and the stories one tells, I mean, Mrs. Thatcher is still a divisive figure. If one you know talks to anyone who lived through Thatcherite Britain, people love her or they hate her. So that bit I think is interesting and makes for a very interesting story. And you know, and so also Reagan, who again was seen as being on the fringe of his party, uh, and then again sort of stormed the bastion. On the specific question of whether one can expect a Mr. Modi, a PM Modi to be um, uh, a sort of uh, bold economic reformer, I think the, that that probably is too much to expect for a, you know, for a number of reasons that uh, we can talk about. Uh, let me just pinpoint one, uh, just, just to, to, to you know, kick let's things off. Later as we go on, let's just sort of, let's start off with the broad yeah. comparison, then I'd like Mihir to jump in on that. Uh, what makes sense about the comparison to you and, and what doesn't? Well, <clears throat> that uh, Vivek made a very good point about the similarity in the biographies. I think that what Thatcher had going for her was this whole idea that she was from outside what we would call in, you know, in, in DC would say outside the beltway. She was a grocer's daughter. She was somebody who cared about small business in a way that, you know, the great labor grandees or the, um, you know, the Tory aristocrats before her did not. And I think that there is a very real sense in which Narendra Modi brings that same idea of being, you know, from a Western, much more market-oriented state, being a chief minister of a market-oriented state rather than a Delhi policy maven. All these things mean that there is a there's sort of an emotional resonance with the Thatcher idea. I think the big difference is not just that it is difficult to imagine uh, Modi carrying out the kind of massive um, reform of of the states that Thatcher did. The interesting thing is that I don't think Mr. Modi way that he has developed a constituency for reform. When Thatcher came in, everybody knew what she stood for. She stood for privatization, deregulation, de deregula uh, um, deregulation, uh, uh, breaking down unions, etc., etc., etc. I think Mr. Modi can claim he's got a mandate to deliver certain jobs, to deliver infrastructure, but not much more than that. James, would you agree with that? On the latter point, I, I wouldn't actually. That, that when Mrs. Thatcher arrived in British government in 1979, the, the radical that she would become uh, was not really widely recognized, and it wasn't until the latter stages of her premiership, probably after the Falklands War into the second and third term, that most of the things that we now associate with Thatcherism, uh, or many of them came to fruition, and many of the things that Mihir mentioned. However, I think one comparison, regardless of how much of a reformer you think Mr. Modi will be, if you want to be compared to um, a, a Thatcher or a Reagan, uh, you have to start with a large challenge, and I suppose at least uh, on that level you can say that, that Modi has a, 
has a very apposite moment because in 1979 the British economy was in a terrible mess and in 2014 the Indian economy is in a terrible mess. So in that sense at least the possibility is there given that that um, you know were, uh, were the country to be growing relatively strongly nobody would be even talking in those terms. So. But you know there's, I'll stay with you James, there's this, I mean Mehir raises the point that there is a certain ambivalence, right? So for on, the, on the one hand, you have many Modi supporters who have argued that he really does stand for a more market-friendly approach to Indian economic policy. But then others, including Meher, have written that when you look at the specifics, this is a person who, for example, supported the food security bill, which is offering subsidized food to two-thirds of Indians. This is someone who did not oppose a land acquisition bill that many people who are market-friendly thought would be a disaster for Indian industry. So how do you square his stated positions with the obvious hopes of his supporters? Well, I suppose I think you start from the fact that India is a significantly more left-wing country than, you know, the Anglo, the Anglo market democracies. The median point of political discourse is fairly far to the left. So what counts as uh, a free market reformer is rather different. Um, it, it would would be very radical indeed if either Mr. Modi had a handbag or he were to cop carry a copy around of Hayek within it. Um, I mean, n nonetheless, um, I, I think the, the bigger problem isn't so much that Mr. Modi has a, has a mixed record, it's that we don't really know with any great precision what uh, the party's platform would be or, or, or when they have set an objective, how they plan to carry it out. You can read the BJP's manifesto, um, and it contains a lot of uh, rather broad uh, objectives, but absolutely no specificity on how they will be carried out and how they will be achieved. And so I think it would certainly be fair to say that while a lot of the commentary, particularly in the Western press, has been going over whether or not Mr. Modi is some kind of uh, sort of hidden Hindu fanatic who might suddenly reveal himself upon being uh, elected. The greater worry is that the BJP's economic proposals are really pretty half thought out. And so I suppose the more charitable way of thinking about it is that Mr. Modi, as with Mr. Thatcher, may become more radical as he goes on, but might start out relatively moderately in the beginning. But why, why, why are we willing to believe that this is possible with Narendra Modi? Whereas it would be it would be laughable if this were, say, a Prime Minister Rajnath Singh. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that is that's the absolutely right question. I mean, a couple of things. One, he's been uh, very vague uh, in the campaign about exactly what he would do in the way of economic reform. And you know, as you say, uh, what he has said has been a very mixed kind of a message. That that you know, it's this famous four-word mantra of maximum governance, minimum government. I mean, that would be music to the ears of a Reagan or a Thatcher or you know. Hayek or, or whoever, but when you probe deeper, he supported the FSB, uh, as was pointed out. Um, he is, you know, in a major interview on TV, he said, look, the poor have will sort of have first dibs on the state's coffers. Now, if one wanted to make a case for sort of Modi as a hidden sort of a closet economic reformer, what one would say is, look, that this is how he has to campaign, uh, as James pointed out very correctly, the center of, of, of gravity intellectually in India is so far to the left for a variety of reasons that coming out, and this is by the way the big difference with, with, with Thatcher and Reagan, Thatcher and Reagan could, Reagan could both hark back to an older intellectual tradition, you know, pre-war tradition where the market was first and the state was second. Now Mr. Modi cannot really do that. So, he's, so the best case is, look, that he's treading carefully, he's a shrewd politician, why come out and say all these radical, bold things before he's won, you know, and, 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 and create alarm among the BJP's traditional constituencies? So why do that? Why not sort of, you know, be vague, uh, talk about governance, about the economy, jobs, and then sort of test the waters once he comes in, and then slowly, you know, move into reform mode? That's the best case I think one, one could make for Modi yeah. as a putative Thatcher. Mirza, so, I mean, for, for me, Mihir, the 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 strongest case really comes down to not what Modi has said on the campaign trail, which as Vivek says is just stuff perhaps that you have to say on the campaign trail in India, but the kinds of people he has attracted. I mean, we all remember there was a time when uh, in uh, Jagdish Bhagwati's famous, uh, famous phrase, 
that if you know the BJP economists were, if 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 the well, if the people the BJP called economists were economists, he was a Bharat Natyam dancer. But it's very different with Modi. You have serious economists, uh, including Vivek, who who really see potential, who see him as the best bet for India, and so he is. I think it's fair to say that he has a cohort of supporters and advisors who would very much like to see him be India's Thatcher. Do you think that's fair? I think that is, <clears throat> it's absolutely true that he has around him many, many people, and he's drawn to him many, many people who have opinions about the free market that I thought would be comfortable with. Um, there, there, there are, there are um, um, certain caveats that I would, I would draw to that, and that is that he seems to have also drawn to him and given a very respectful hearing uh, to some people who I can at best call cranks. You know, uh, you have an entire group of, and I'm not talking about the traditional protectionist xenophobic wing of the BJP, um, economic xen xenophobic wing of the BJP. I'm talking about sort of more novel cranks, such as, um, you know, these chaps in Pune who want to um, end income tax altogether, which um, might be interesting, except they want to replace it with a transaction tax on on uh, on bank accounts, which would probably drive everything, uh, you know, drive everything into the informal economy. And um, you know, he has shared the stage with some. I've I've been at a meeting of his in Delhi, where he's shared the stage with these people and complimented their work. He's complimented the work of anti-GM activists. Um, it's it's all very doubtful, you know. Um, he, he seems to be listening to a large number of people, and we don't have a clear idea of what his own vision might be, of his own sort of uh, coherent uh, um, melding of that. But is it accurate to say that even if he is listening to some people you would call cranks, that he is certainly not listening to the traditional BJP cranks in, on economic issues? I'm talking about Swadeshi, Jagran, Munch, that whole crowd, they seem to really have you know, melted into the background. Have melted into the background. Um, one can never assume that they've gone away forever. You know, he let's say he gives one economic ministry to some sympathies to this, uh, to to those uh, to those um, old style BJP conservatives be in trouble. Um, but I think that the most important thing to note is he is someone who has demonstrated in Gujarat his ability to listen to absolutely everybody he can get his hands on and then take his own decision. And it's not always a, it's not always some the kind of decision that you might think emerges from, you know, this is a clear free market person or this is a clear uh, protectionist person. It's something pragmatic and in between. And I think that's uh, we're going to see more of the same. James, if you're looking ahead and let's presume that it's a Modi government, uh, what are the signs? What, what would you look toward what, what would tell you within the first few months that this is indeed somebody who is serious about reform and what would tell you that um, maybe our hopes were premature? Well, I suppose the first thing I'd say is that there, there's, off, there has a, there's a sense I think has built up over the last few years that India's government is uh, somehow sociologically broken, that nothing works anymore, decisions don't get taken, uh, the, the previously highly functioning civil service um, has basically been ground down by the current administration. There have been a couple of examples in recent years when that has been proven not to be correct, where simply a change of personnel has brought new energy and focus to previously rather low performing institutions, particularly when the current finance minister replaced the one before him, and also when uh, Raghu Rajan came in at the RBI. So I, just to say I don't even discount the fact that we might discover that under the detritus of the last couple of years that the, the central Indian state actually works quite well when, um, when it has a leader who wants to brandish, uh, brandish his stick and get people working. I mean, what are people looking for? I suppose the, who, the character, who is the finance minister? Is it somebody who um, you know, a serious economist would take seriously? Um, what happens in the first budget? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of things that are being examined carefully by international investors from the government's treatment of taxation to its willingness to pare back certain types of subsidy programs. I mean, these are the sort of things that are going to be looked for 
uh, over the next, well, the next month and a half, I suppose, up in the run-in and immediately after the budget. I mean, there is an argument that he has no choice but to be a reformer. What do you make of that, James? Um, well, I, I, I suppose in the sense that, I mean, no, no, nobody now is talking about the fact that India is going to have its sovereign credit rating downgraded. Uh, it is remarkable that it's only nine months or slightly more than nine months, but, but after which India was somehow the poster child for emerging market dysfunction. That world has gone, at least for now, and I don't know too many people who think it's going to come back. So in that sense, the government does have a lot more room for maneuver than its predecessors did in the middle uh, uh, to sort of last autumn, last fall. Um, however, the fiscal situation is still perilous, uh, and to that extent, I, I would expect this government to reduce subsidies on fuel, to roll back some of the more generous welfare uh, uh, subsidies introduced by the last government, but those things in and of themselves don't add up to what I think we're talking about here, a, a radical reforming administration. To get into that sort of territory, you really need to begin to start talking about much more politically difficult uh, reforms, um, the reform of the labor market, uh, the reform of land regulation, the relationship between the center and the states. All of these things require a, a leader to come in with a mandate, as it looks like Mr. Modi will have, and pick some potentially bruising political battles. I mean, that, in a sense, is the measure of a figure who is to be compared with Thatcher. It's, are you brave enough to use your political capital in a way that is bloody but ultimately changes the country that you govern? I think there the jury, I mean, then it's, it's much more difficult to tell, as both Vivek and Mihir have said, whether Mr. Modi wants to be that sort of leader or whether he simply wants to be a slightly more efficient administrator and steward of the same sort of system that the previous incumbents created. Vivek, if you were advising uh, Mr. Modi and if you are, and, and, and your brief was to, to send a signal, especially to foreign investors, to send a signal to the world that sure. uh, he is serious, uh, he means business, what, what would be the top three things that he should do quickly? Well, let me tell you the things he shouldn't do, and in a sense, a negative, uh, you know, message of not doing something silly would, you know, would send out a very good signal. So, so don't, you know, don't don't do a, do a U-turn on FDI and retail, even though that's the status position of the BJP. Just, you know, kick that down the line. So, signal that look, you know, yes, we had to campaign on anti-FDI and retail. We're not actually going to do that. Um, so, open up FDI and other sectors. Keep keep Raghurajan where he is at at the RBI. Uh, so in a sense, what he doesn't do, if he, if he doesn't sort of engage in what one might call populist bits of the BJP manifesto, those would be very good. And then, you know, kickstart some major projects, you know, big infra project, to signal, look, India is open for business, um, and that could be a messaging for domestic and foreign businesses and investors. I, I mean, those would be the three things that, that I'd pick. Let me take a I question from the audience. Uh, there's, there's a question from Vijay Nilakani, who's the uh, president and CEO of OBEI Inc. And he has a question about uh, privatization. And this, the question is, does, 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 do we, does Modi have the evidence to take on vested interests and entrenched interests, such as public sector unions, the bureaucracy, state-owned enterprises? Have we seen ev any evidence, Mihir, of this person having either the inclination uh, or the will to do this? I think that if they thwarted his will, he would go after them, much like Thatcher. But he has been very clear on the subject of public sector enterprises. Not necessarily think of them as a drain on the exchequer. Thinks that they can be better managed, they can be turned around, they can be given an esprit de corps, and um, he con continually re references um, a couple of good stories, a couple of good uh, um, uh, uh, turnaround stories in Gujarat with public sector enterprises. So I am not certain that ideologically his first, get, his first instinct would be, in fact, to go for privatization. And I think that uh, many in the BJP who have um, identified with privatization in the past also recognize that it's not really on the agenda. Would you agree with that, James? Yes, I suspect I would. I mean, I, I, I've heard the same stories about what happened in Gujarat, where he tended to 
bring in professional management rather than introduce major structural changes. However, I mean, I think that uh, whether or not you're a, a, a raging free marketeer, there is a very good case um, for certain types of privatization um, in India, certainly within the banking system. There seems to me absolutely no reason whatsoever why you shouldn't um, uh, privatize Air India, which is a hopeless airline. Um, you could hardly do worse. And while the whole hearted privatization of coal India might be difficult, certainly the breaking up of that monopoly and the transferring of some of it to different forms of ownership seems like a, a policy that at least is worth looking at. But I think I agree with Mihir that I haven't seen, uh, you know, there are those around the BJP such as Arun Shuri, the previous divestment minister, who have more of a twinkle in their eye about what might be done. But, but I haven't got much evidence that a radical form of transfer of ownership um, uh, to the private sector from the public sector is very likely in the short term. How do you think markets are going to respond? Because there seems to be there's a certain amount of hype. There's certainly a lot of expectation. Let's just say he does what Mihir said, what what Vivek said, which is really, you know, which is really let's not let's not mess up. Don't do anything stupid. Manage things a little bit better. Uh, let's have a few infrastructure projects. Um, pretty ho hum. Do you, do, what, what happens to markets and what happens to how they view, how India is viewed, if, if that's what, uh, say, the first six months of a Modi administration is going to be? So this is for me. I think well, the markets are mysterious beasts. I think even that would probably excite um, a degree of optimism about India if you simply had basically competent government in which some form of infrastructure investment was happening and uh, there was no um, no fallbacks. On the other hand, you know, I, I would add to Vivek's list. I mean, it seems to me that there are some very clear signals that they can take if they unilaterally decided to reverse the piece of legislation introduced a couple of years ago, targeting uh, the British company Vodafone over their tax status in the budget. That would, I mean, that would probably be the single easiest win uh, that would convince uh, global investors that. Um, that this was a, a changed government um, and a lot of other companies are equally worried about their treatment by the tax office and so you could make some statement in that regard and I, I think even a few relatively small things like that which would cost the exchequer very much could cause um, a, a very uh, sort of strong reaction in the market um, without even having to, to get anywhere near some of these larger structural issues that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Let me take another question from the audience. Uh, I have a question from Huma Yusuf, who's a well-known columnist for the Pakistani newspaper Dawn. And let me uh, let me pose that to you, Mihir. Uh, Huma asks, uh, what, where does trade with Pakistan fit into Modi's economic message? Well, I think that that's a very, very contingent um, statement. Under uh, Manmohan Singh, there was a very clear sense that he thought that trade with Pakistan was instrumentally essential for diffusing tension in South Asia and for eventually moving towards a lasting and more um, a lasting peace on the subcontinent. Um, Mr. Modi has again sent out slightly um, a conflicting signals. On the one hand, he has broadly said that, for example, more tourism, more people-to-people -people contact between India and Pakistan, he's actually used the words uh, tourism. He has a great fondness for alliteration. Um, but on the other hand, he has, I think, one of the first few things that he will want to do is to demonstrate to India's neighbors that um, that India is is no longer the soft state that it has been or it has been seen to be in the past 10 years and immediately tr I see trade as being the first casualty of that. I think broadly he would approve of trade but he will he'll need to show um, determination to tackle Pakistan and China first. So if there's so no trade yeah, as long as terrorism. Yeah, jump in Vivek. Sorry, no, I mean I, I must say on the latter point I don't agree uh, uh, with this concern, because you know, there's also you know the, the the Nixon in China kind of argument that that Modi is already seen as being hawkish, as being from the right, and so on. So I don't think he has to do terribly much to convince Pakistan that look, he's not going to be a pushover. 
So I don't necessarily share the concern that he's going to have to do something in a sense or, you know, sort of to, to, to stall or, or damage the, you know, it's a very small amount of trade as it is. But on the contrary, I mean, if one can play devil's advocate, he, someone from the right, someone who's seen as, as a hawk and you know, certainly put out hawkish messages in the past, uh, would be better poised to actually improve Indo-Pak ties. So that would be the, the, the counter argument. James, how important is the team that we're going to see? I mean, we should have, uh, we, we, we may, within a week or so, we, should, we may know who the key appointments are. Do you, do you have your sense of what a dream team would look like? Well, I, I think at a, at a high level, um, if you have Mr. Modi uh, governing with Governor Rajan at the RBI and then a finance minister who isn't a sort of party apparatchik with no knowledge of economics, then that's going to, that, that, that looks pretty good. I mean, I think from the market's point of view, there's a, I mean, nobody really has the, the faintest idea what's in Mr. Modi's mind. We go right back to the beginning. You know, he is an outsider. He's not terribly well known in Delhi and therefore, or in Mumbai, and therefore there are a lot of people running around desperately speculating about things that they know little about. That I, I wouldn't stop myself from doing the same. Um, but the, the, the point being that the markets at the moment are, are flirting with the notion that he might appoint um, some well-known economic figure um, who would be very congenial to uh, bankers in Bombay. Uh, Deepak Parekh, uh, uh, the chairman of a large bank here, is a, is a figure who you hear people talking about from time to time. Um, I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, but even so, if you, if you keep Governor Rajan at the RBI, you have um, a, a sort of economically plausible figure as the finance minister and then a, a few other advisors of the sort, the, the, the sort, of, sort of serious economists who you've been discussing in and around either in advisory positions or at the planning commission, that would be a very good thing. The final point I'd say is, uh, uh, just to touch on the point I made before, that these positions matter a great deal. The difference between the previous finance minister but one and the, the last finance minister, Mr. Chidambaram, was so enormous that it does convince you, without having to get into the, the great man theory of history, that if you pick the wrong candidate for a job like the finance minister, then it can be completely disastrous. So I think the worst thing that could happen is if Modi came in and appointed you know, a, fr a friend of his from Gujarat who uh, had no knowledge of that sort of position. Th those decisions can uh, have long-term and extremely damaging consequences. Well, we're running out of time, so let's just quickly s sum up um, one final question for, for each of the three of you. Uh, how, if you have to predict the first, first hundred days of a Modi government, what's he going to do in terms of the economy? Why don't I start with you, Vivek? Well, I, I'll have to preface it by saying we don't yet know the size of his mandate. We're going by exit polls and you know, we know that they can go wrong. If it's a strong mandate, um, I expect he will try to jumpstart infrastructure uh, he will hold back on rolling back FDI in multi-brand retail uh, and try to do what he can to get us back on a positive investment cycle because that really is frozen up. And I think one, if it, and if he can do that in the first 90 or 100 days, I think that markets uh, will look at it uh, positively as, as this, you know, this is a good start at least. Mayor? Well, I think the first thing we're going to do is to seriously question the numbers that the previous government has left behind for the fiscal deficit and for tax revenue and so on. Uh, the, 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 the UPA government has played a lot of sort of rather cheeky slate of hand with all this. And Mr. Modi is probably going to come in and say, look, we've been told it's 4.6 or 4.7% of GDP. It's actually 5.6. I've been given a bad hand. And then he's going to say, but although I've been given a bad hand, I'm actually going to probably increase spending, I'm going to start building infrastructure, India is open for business, these come, these contracts are going to be handed out, start bidding. And um, I think that if he has a, a you know, he'll have a, he'll have a couple of hundred days in which, even with bad numbers, people will be willing to give him time. Okay. Yeah, I quite agree with that. I, I, I was going to say exactly the same thing, that when an incumbent government government comes in, the initial instinct is to blame everything that is wrong on the last lot, and I think that it's highly likely that they will go through this process of reassessing the numbers and casting a lot of mud around. I mean, I, I, I suspect, in a funny way, the, the, the strength of India's position is how bad it is. 
Um, and because so many things have gone wrong, I, I, I suspect that it will not be terribly difficult for Mr. Modi to fashion a series of impressive looking announcements that appear to put things back on track. There are infrastructure projects that aren't working in every sector. There are companies that are effectively bankrupt all across the economy. There are complaints that are relatively easily addressable. There are subsidies that can be trimmed. Um, and, and therefore, I, I think that, that even without getting into the, the, the deeper structural reforms to factor markets, there is a good chance that this first 100 days will end up looking pretty impressive. On that optimistic note, uh, I'd like to say thank you to all three of you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.